So as we're all standing, I have a question for us before we, we sit down and get comfortable. I want to know how many of you are here. And now, before you answer, I want to tell you what I mean, right? When I ask the question, how many of you are here, right? Not just here in the building, but are actually here, right? You're present in this moment right now. So if you're here, I need you to say, I'm here. That was not very convincing. If you're here, I need you to say, I'm here. I'm here. All right, if you're here, then I want to say, welcome. Right? I'm honored and I'm thankful that you're here, that you're with us in this moment. And since we're talking about this moment, I want us to take a moment, just as we're standing, as our, our focus is fixed in this moment, to thank God for the freedom that we have to gather physically, right, as disciples of Jesus, to feed on the bread of life, right, the living word of God, right, it, it just take a moment to realize that we are standing in the presence of the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. We have the opportunity to stand here in this moment and worship the Lamb of God who was slain for the forgiveness of sins. So I'm glad that you're here. Now you can have a seat. Because unfortunately, some of you won't be here for long. You may still be here physically, but mentally or emotionally, your mind, your attention is going to be somewhere else. You're here now, but in a moment, you'll get a text and your mind will go to that message. Some of you got help. You will actually initiate a text message right in the middle of my message. Some of you won't be able to take just the, the absence anymore. You'll have to check Snapchat. You'll have to just check that Instagram notification because you can't help not knowing what's been going on for the last seven minutes. Some of you, that's all you'll be thinking about. All that you have to do when you leave here. Or if you're like me, you start thinking about like, man, I ain't had dinner yet. I came straight here. Like, where am I going to eat afterwards? Like you start thinking about anything else. Or you might just be worried about something and your mind starts to drift towards that thing coming up, that game I got coming up, that test that I have coming up. Or your mind starts to drift to that distracting person in the row in front of you. Or your mind starts to drift to that cute girl two rows in front of you. The one that was worshiping and like ain't got a ring on her finger so you know she's available. Like, And so if you're here, I want to say that I'm so glad that you're here because I know that some of you won't be here for long. So I want to read to you God's word, and we're going to look at an unusual text, but it's Jesus' first miracle that he performed, right? And it's at a wedding. So now if you know the context, or if you don't know the context, let me tell you, it was an incredibly embarrassing moment for the host of this wedding, right? The person that was throwing this party because they ran out of wine. Right? And so Jesus' mom comes running up and said, Jesus, you got to go do something. And so he said to the servants, he said, fill six massive jars full of water. Now, these weren't regular jars. These were probably 20, 30-gallon jars. Looked like the photo that's up there. Yeah, like these were big old jars. And so he said to the servant, he said, draw the water out of those jars and then take it to the master of the banquet, the host. And in John chapter 2, verse 9, that's where we'll start, his word tells us this. It tells us that they did so. Then it says, And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. And now this last part, as I read this text, I read it as, But you saved the best for last, but that's not what God's word says, right? What God's word says is, but you have saved the best till now. Not till last, but till now. And so because of that phrase right there, the title of today's message, this part three of our series, is that your best days are now. Your best days are now. And so if you missed the last few weeks, we're in a series called A Better Way. And what we're doing is we're looking at the way that Jesus lived, right? Not just the truth that he taught, but the way that he lived. And one of the most 
striking qualities about the way that Jesus lived is that no matter what he was doing, he was always fully present. He was always fully present. He was present in the moment. Jesus was always there. He lived with an undivided attention in the moment. Right? In fact, what I want to do tonight is I'm going to show you two stories in Scripture, and they come back to back. And these just illustrate Jesus' heart for the people that were right in front of him. And the first one is in Luke's gospel. And so this passage, Jesus is walking into Jericho. And there were a large crowd surrounding him. And the photo of Jericho that I have up here is actually about 1,400 years prior to when the walls of, like, to when this story takes place. So this is a picture of what they thought it would look like when the walls of Jericho came down. Again, about 1,400 years prior to our story. But this gives you a picture of kind of this big city, this grand city with all these people gathering around Jesus as he came in. The walls have come back up. The city is booming, and people are fighting for Jesus' attention. And as he's walking in, a blind man, right, a blind man who's out begging on the street. His name's Bartimaeus. He cries out to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He cries out to Jesus, and the disciples who were with Jesus got offended. Because in their minds, they're saying, Jesus doesn't have time for you, guy. Jesus is too important. We've got places to be. He's too busy. Jesus is not going to stop for some guy begging on the side of the road. And so the disciples rebuked this guy, but then what's so funny is Jesus turned and rebuked the disciples. He rebuked the disciples, and what he did was he engaged with this man. He engaged fully with this guy. He stopped. He gave him his full attention in that moment, and he said to this man, he said, what do you want me to do for you? And again, this man cries out, could you heal me? Can you please heal me? I haven't been able to see my whole life. And Jesus spoke a miraculous word of faith, and he healed this man. Right? One miracle is obviously that Jesus healed this man. But the second thing I want you to notice is that Jesus stopped for a guy that no one had time for. Jesus stopped. Stopped what he was doing, gave his full attention to a guy that no one else had time for. Fully engaged with the person who was right in front of him. The second story that I told you we were going to look at, it's a consecutive story. It's the, the next one we see. It's in John chapter 19. And it again mentions Jericho. And Luke actually tells us in his gospel that Jesus was going somewhere, right? He was passing through. That's how this passage starts in Luke 19, right? Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So Jericho was not his destination. He's just passing through on his way somewhere else, meaning he's got somewhere else to be. But verse 2 says, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. And so Jesus is passing through Jericho. And if you remember, he's already been interrupted once by this poor guy, this blind beggar. And now he's going to be interrupted again by a rich, corrupt tax collector. And what I love about Jesus is that he's got time for the down and out, the poor, the blind, but he's also got time for the up and out, right? He's got time for you no matter where you come from, no matter how bad your baggage is, no matter how dirty it is, no matter how rich it is, right? Jesus cares about you. And Jesus stops a second time for this guy named Zacchaeus. So now, if you don't know who Zacchaeus was, I want to tell you about Zacchaeus. All right, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up into a sycamore tree to see what he could see. If anybody grew up in church as a kid, you drank the Kool-Aid, you know who Zacchaeus was, right? It's a rite of passage. Well, he was a tax collector, which may not mean a lot to you in this culture or at this age, but during this time, this was one of the most corrupt people there was, right? A tax collector, what they would do is they would have charged the people what they owed, but then they would add to it, right? They'd put a little extra on top for themselves, and they would keep 
the difference. So there was what you owed and then what they charged, and they kept the rest for themselves. So these people were not liked. This is one of the most despised and hated people around. And Jesus sees this guy and calls him by name. Right? Jesus calls him by name, Zacchaeus. And Jesus, essentially, what he does in this conversation he has is he invites himself over for lunch. He says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. And as he was already going somewhere, right, he's passing through Jericho, already been interrupted once, he sees this no good, corrupt, hated sinner and gives him his full attention. And as he's talking with Zacchaeus back at his house, Zacchaeus has this moment of just deep repentance, right, in the presence of Jesus. And he says something like, I've sinned so much. I've hurt so many people, and I'm so sorry. He says, I'll do anything I can to make it up. And he's just rambling, like he's just broken. And he just kind of blurts this out, like you can feel like he's just saying anything. And he says, I'll give half my possessions to the poor, and I'll pay back four times to anyone that I stole from. And Jesus looks at this man, he looks at Zacchaeus, and he says, today, right, today, in this moment, right now, he says, today salvation has come to your house. Jesus had an undivided attention in the moment. He stops and he gives people one of the greatest gifts that he can give, which is his attention and his love. And Jesus was always fully present in the moment. And I'll be honest, I want to be like that. But unfortunately, I'm not like that. And as I've gone through this series, I've been praying and asking God to help me be engaged with whatever it is that's in front of me. Right? I want to be where my feet are. I want to not just live for the happy moments, right? the up, the mountaintop moments, not just the powerful moments, the moments that look outwardly meaningful. But I want to be fully present in all of the moments, right? even the annoying ones. Any of y'all feel like you're living in just the middle of an annoying moment? Right now where everything just gets on your nerves and it's annoying and you don't like your situation like at all ever. Some seasons of life are like that. Some seasons are more annoying than others. And I can tell you from experience, all right, Michaela and I are raising two young pets. This is what they look like and you're going to go, oh, and they're cute. But yeah, they look cute. But let me tell you, those two are weapons of mass destruction and they are my problems. <laughs> Nine times out of ten. So let me tell you, there have been countless days, right, when we come home to these two. And you would think, like, oh, what a great end to your day. You get to see those two. No, bro, like, let me tell you, the trash has been torn into, right? There's trash just thrown all over the house. There's stuffing and clothes just thrown all over. Like, some part of our home is going to be destroyed. Or the, the classic one, just the mystery spot that's now in the carpet that then forces us to play the game that everyone loves called Guess That Stain. And so then we have to go and clean up this mystery, right? Who knows what it is? Could be pee, could be vomit, who knows? Who knows where it came from? One of those two, for sure. And I convince myself still that somehow, someday, we're gonna come home to a clean home multiple days in a row. Right, and there you may get one, but the next day you know it's gonna be bad. But the reality with pets, and I'm about to crush your heart, is that sadly those two are going to die one day. And that seems dark, but stick with me. One day, we will come home to a clean house. But those two won't be there. Because they'll have gone away to the farm, right? We'll make it live. I say all this, there's a point. Watch this. Some of you are doing the same thing, and you don't even realize it. Some of you are complaining today about moments that you're going to miss tomorrow. You're complaining about things now that seem so annoying, but one day you're going to look back and be like, man, those really weren't bad times. Like, I really do miss those times, you're literally complaining about the very moments right now that one day in the future you're going to miss. Right? Whether it's playing a high school sport that seems annoying and you hate going to practice, but one day when you don't play sports anymore and you're grown, you'll look back and be like, man, those really were good times. 
playing with my friends, like getting to go out there like on Friday nights or football, like whatever it is. Or if it's just going to school and being around your friends because one day you're going to graduate and go to all different colleges and not be as close as you are right now. And you'll miss those moments that right now you complain about. Jesus was fully engaged in the moment. So again, I ask, are you guys here? Y'all still here? Still got you? If you're still here, say, I'm here. I'm here. All right, because statistics would show that I've lost some of you by now. Right, seriously, like Harvard did a study, and they said 47% of the time, people's minds are not where their feet are. 47% of the time, almost half. You're in a conversation with someone, and your mind is not thinking about that conversation. 47% of the time, you're sitting at church, or at dinner with your family, or talking to someone at school, or at work, and your mind is not there. Almost half of your life, your mind is not fully engaged with where your body is physically. Right? In fact, one of the biggest enemies of our attention is our cell phones. Right? It is. It's shocking to think about how often we can be distracted from the place that we are. But a lot of it comes from cell phones. Right? In fact, little numbers for you. In fact, the average cell phone user touches their phone 2,617 times a day. 2,617 times a day. That's a lot. That's a lot of time that you're not in the moment. You're reaching for your phone. Whatever it is that's in front of you is not as important as whatever it is that's on the phone. The text, the alert, the likes, the snap, whatever it is. And that's just the average, because the amazing thing about some of you is that you're so above average, right? We're not a group of average people. We're a group of above average people, right? When we go all out in our dysfunction, some of us go way, way out, right? So the average is 2,617, but the top 10%, that's probably people your age, uh, <laughs> they use their phones more than 5,400 times a day. And can I just tell you, that's gross. Like, that's just disgusting. Like, find a way to watch that. Like, you touch this thing over 5,000 times a day. That thing's dirty. And then you go and hold it up to your, like, face and talk on the phone to somebody and, like, act like it's all cute and, like, take, you know, that thing's gross. Like, your phone is gross. You're touching it thousands of times a day. Right? You aren't with whatever or whoever is in front of you. Right? Your mind is somewhere else. And if it's not on the phone, then sometimes it's just playing games, right? My mind loves to play games. The top two games that my mind plays right now, I play the win-then game, right? The win-then game, the one-day win, then I'll be happy, right? You may do this too, like when I'm out of high school, then I'll be happy. That then turns into when I'm out of college, then I'll be happy. When I have a real job, then I'll be happy. When I'm married, then I'll be happy. When I have kids, then I'll be happy. When my kids are grown and out of the house, I'll be happy. Right? And so many of us, we're literally going through our entire life wishing away the current moment. Right? Wishing away the moment that we're in. We're missing what we have in front of us. And so I just want to tell you, just plead with you. Right? And this is from God's word. Don't miss what you have now, pursuing what you want later. Jesus was fully engaged with what was in front of him. And so don't miss what you have now, pursuing what you want later. Jesus was fully engaged in the moment. And so my mind, if it's not playing the win-then game, I often play the what-if game, right? Projecting into the future. What if this doesn't happen? And some of you may do this too, right? What if I don't pass that test? What if I don't get into the right college? What if I can't get the, the right job, my dream job? What if I don't attract the right spouse? And then what if I have dumb kids, right? All because I don't pass this test. We tend to do this. And it goes on and on and on. But look at what Jesus said in Matthew, Matthew, uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. This is verse 34. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. 
for tomorrow will worry about itself. Don't worry about what's coming. Tomorrow will worry about itself. And what I love about Jesus is that he's not telling us to not plan. Right? Jesus is not anti-planning. He didn't tell you not to plan for the future, but he's telling us not to worry about the future. Don't be holding on to those plans so tight that you're worried and you're stressed and you make yourself anxious. He's telling us don't worry about it. <clears throat> so again, I ask, are you still here? Because it's really, really important to be present in this moment. It's really important to be present in the moment. So why is it? Why is it, do you think, that we so often aren't fully present? Sometimes we're just distracted. But as I thought about it, one of the reasons why I think we're often not fully present is because we lack faith. We lack faith. We're all freaked out about something that happened a long time ago, and i got to figure it out and fix it. Or we're all freaked out about something that hasn't even happened yet that we think is going to happen in the future, and we've got to find a way to prevent it, to make sure it happens. We lack faith. And what I've discovered is that the only way that we can be present, fully present in the moment, is to surrender the past that you can't change and trust God with a future that you can't control. Let me say that again. Surrender the past that you can't change and trust God with a future that you can't control. The only way to be fully present in this moment is to let go of that past that you can't change. No matter what you do, and trust that God has it. And surrender your future and trust that God is good and he's already there. And because he redeems our past and because he's good in the future, you can be fully engaged and present with the person that is in front of you in the present. But it takes faith. It takes faith in God to engage in his calling right in front of you. Not be worried about the past, not be stressed about the future, but to be engaged. It takes faith. In fact, I love the way that James phrases this. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. And he says this in chapter 4 of James, verse 13 and 14. He says, come now. Somebody say now. now. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Then he says this, he says, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Right? You're a mist. Right? Think about it this way. It's cold out. So when you walk out to go home and you see your breath, watch how quickly it shows up and then fades away. That's our life. The image that is so powerful to me is this, this hourglass. Right? This is your life. You're here for a little while, and the life that God has given you is passing away in the moment. And there's three things about this picture that are interesting to me. One thing is like how fast that is going right now. But no, like the first thing is that you have no idea how much sand is at the top. You think you do, but I'll tell you there's been a lot of people who thought there was more up there than there really was. No one knows how much is up top. The second is that no matter what you do, you can't stop that sand from flowing. Time is passing. Time is passing. Time is passing. Every day is a gift from God. Today is a gift from God. And some of you are wishing this day away. And the third thing is that once that sand is at the bottom, you can never get it back. You can never get it back. And that's why at the beginning of this message, I called us to stand and celebrate this moment. Because at that moment, we were together in the presence of God. The very way that we still are right now at this moment. And so the most important moment of your life, we could say, is experiencing God right now. Right now in this moment. That's why I love what David said in Psalm 118, verse 24. He said, this is the day the Lord has made. You got today. This is the day. Right? This is the day. And because this is God's day, what does he say? He says, we will rejoice and be glad in it. And so if you're still here, and I hope you're still here, 
Because I want to tell you, you can't be happy where you're not. You can't serve Jesus where you're not. You can't love people where you're not. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the most important moment right now. The most important person is the one that is right in front of you. This is the most important moment. And so what I want you to recognize is that I used to live for these same things, right? For the big moments, the special moments. But the more I began to be fully present, the more I began to recognize that the most powerful moments are often the smallest ones. The most meaningful moments often aren't those mountaintops, but they're the conversations that you have in between with the people that you love. And so again, I plead with y'all, don't miss what you have now, pursuing what you want later. This is the day that the Lord has made. And when you look at the way that Jesus lived, not just how he taught, but the way that he lived as he walked along, taking his time, people weren't interruptions, people weren't inconveniences. They were moments and opportunities to engage and to show the goodness and the love of God. This moment is all that you have. This moment is all that is promised to us. This moment. And so this moment matters. And so to be fair, I don't want you to think I'm trying to make anybody feel guilty. Like I get distracted so easily. Right? I got ADD so bad. I can hardly be anywhere. Like you think you're a distraction to the people next to you. And like I have to look at all y'all. And like when you're distracted, I'm distracted. But I'm working on it. But when you think about Jesus, if there was any time that Jesus would have been distracted, he would have been consumed with his self, distracted from the people around him, it would have been on the cross. Think about it. He's the sinless son of God. And now he's been stripped naked. He's been beaten until he was beyond recognition of a man. He's been whipped until his back was left open and bleeding. Probably got his internal organs hanging out, right? And now he's hanging on a cross, fighting for every breath just to pull himself up and get one more breath. As people cursed him and spit on him. If that was me, I'd be a little distracted. I wouldn't be thinking about the people that are around me. I'd be thinking about trying not to die, trying to fight for that next breath. But right next to Jesus was a criminal who looked over to Jesus and had a conversation. And the guy said something probably more than what's reported, but he said something like, I've done a lot of bad things, and I'm sorry. But what we do know and what is recorded that he said is this. It says he looked at Jesus and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And even in the middle of his suffering, the worst, most painful moment of Jesus' life, he becomes fully engaged with this criminal on the cross next to him. And he looks at this man and says, today, today you will be with me in paradise. Fully engaged in the moment. No matter what the moment was, he was fully engaged. And I don't know who needs to hear this tonight, but hear me again. You cannot serve Jesus where you're not. You cannot love people where you're not. You cannot be happy and fulfilled where you're not. And if your mind is not where your body is, then 47% of the time you're missing out on what God has given you. And so until you realize that this is the day the Lord has made, right? Today, God has saved the best for now. Not the best for last, but the best for now. In this moment, right, in this moment, right now, you can experience his grace. You can experience his mercy. You can experience his forgiveness right now. Right now, his freedom is here. His power is here. His goodness is here. And your purpose is here. In this moment now, God is with us in this moment now. And so your best days are now. And so fully engage with him in this moment that we have together now. 
So as this last song plays, engage. Block out every other distraction and focus only on this moment. Whatever it is that God is speaking to your heart, whether it's repentance, maybe you've never come to Christ before in your entire life, you have no relationship with him. Or maybe you've been walking and saying the right things, but you know you don't really know Jesus. You know about him, you know what the right things to do are, but you know that relationship isn't there and you need to get that right. Or maybe you know that that hourglass is your life and it's ticking away. And we don't know how much we have left. And so maybe tonight you want to get it right and secure your eternity in heaven. Don't put it off till you're older because you don't know how much sand you got left. Don't wait. All we have is this moment. Your life is but a mist. It's here and then it's gone. So don't wait but engage with this moment. Or if you're a believer and you love Christ and you have a relationship with him, but you know that you've become disengaged at times. You know that your mind wanders. You know that you have a struggle to be present in the moment. That there's people that you see every single day that you just pass by. Because it would be an inconvenience to go out of my way. It might, may hurt my, my rep. I may not be as cool if I sit with that person. If I engage with this person. Maybe just spend this moment fully engaged with Christ. Asking him to fix your mind on what he wants for you every single day, every single class, every single moment you walk down the halls to see people the way Christ saw people. To not be so fixed on what you have to do that you can't stop and give your full attention to someone in need. Someone who needs you to share Christ with them. Because that person has an hourglass too. And you don't know how much is in theirs. So don't waste this moment. Worship. Cry out to God. Whatever he is putting on your heart, however he is leading you to respond, you do so. Fully engaged in this moment.